This is a conversation with um, Ellen Crystal, and my name is Art Pinsoff. This is for Nothing Media and my own new podcast called Ocean to Ocean. And Ellen Crystal has a history as being a seeker with and knowing different teachers like or whatever or non teachers like Adi Da, also known as Bubba Free John and UG Krishnamurti. So I don't have any game plan of how this conversation should go, but maybe we could just start with um, how, how would you want to start telling your own story? Yeah. <laughs> um, we're, it's snowing here on the East Coast, and I notice it's very warm in Austin. <laughs> yeah. That's where you are, right? Yeah. yeah, I'm inside. Yeah, we're having a big snowstorm. Wow. So, um, well, my story, um, I come from a long line of criminals and misfits. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And, uh, you know, difficult, you know, childhood, probably. No religious background at all. Mm. But a curiosity about um, this life, what it was. What is this? That was my burning question <laughs> from a very young age. Oh. And then I had, you know, I had experiences and, and was attracted to different things and explored different things. Um, and I'm 73 and a half, so I'm that age group that was affected by that, the six, you know, growing up in the 50s and then the 60s, I was very affected by that and um, gravitated. Well, it just, you know, these things happen. So, um, but, but prior to that, you know, when I was 16, I quit school when I was 16, I married a a Puerto Rican jazz musician. Right. And um, at the time he wasn't really a jazz, he was a musician, but you know, it, it was, um, we were both young. He was 17, I was 16. I got pregnant, so. And um, oh. and then we had a, a very intense, beautiful journey together. Um, the music was sublime. I danced and um, had three children with him. And his name is Tasiji Munoz. And uh, some people might have heard of him because he's like, you know, he's been in all, you know, magazines. He's like, they there was something I found here. I was gonna, because I know you're into music. So I, yeah. Um, I like in, in this in this jazz, uh, jazz times, uh, uh, you know, he's on this Tasiji Munoz, the guru of jazz guitar. <laughs> oh, 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 could you show that cover? Yeah. Tasiji. Maybe. Oh He's yeah. In, in this, yeah. Hold, hold it up for a second so people could see his name, how it's spelled. No, I don't know because I'm sitting kind of close because my the way I have is all I have is a laptop, so I'm kind of. Oh, that's. So his name is. <laughs> I guess it's right here. That's good. Yeah, yeah people yeah. can. Yeah. The, yeah. Guru, the guru. And that was that was Jazz Times. Um. Uh, what year? When was this? 2015, August 2015. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a while ago. But he's he he plays. You know, he has a lot of recordings. He has his own music um, recording business. Not business, but you know, they record his music. Yeah. Um. And so we've been. He lives actually. I live in the Hudson Valley in New York, upstate New York. Okay. It's um. They call it the Hudson Valley because it, it the river the Hudson River runs along it, so it's straight north of the city. And um, he lives in the area too. So, but we've been, we've, since I was, I met him at 15, we've known each other and, and we're, we're close. Yeah. We're friends, very close friends. Wow. Um, he's like a, a teacher to a lot of people. A lot of musicians go to him, but he's, he also, uh, yeah. So we traveled a lot um, and went through a lot of things together and I started to really explore spirituality. I, I would say I, I was with him in Germany for a year, but then I came back to the States by myself and I felt I, I was really drawn to Haight-Ashbury. I was living in New York City. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I didn't know, you know, I was drawn, drawn to California, but I ended up in Haight-Ashbury and um, there was a lot of uh, going on there. And I was not that attracted to, um, I, 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 LSD, mm -hmm. psilocybin, some marijuana, but it was more to explore mm -hmm. rather than to have fun and go party. Although, you know, I probably did some of that, but right. it was, it, there was more of that, that exploration. And, and I was dancing in, in San Francisco. I worked as a dancer. So. Right. Then um, I started to, well, I went back to New York, joined to CG. Um, actually, we lived in the South. I was, we were in North Carolina, Kentucky. He was in the army at the time. So we were traveling a lot. And then we, he was, a, he was in the U.S. Army band for a while, but he was, he, he was in a jazz band there, but he wasn't in the, the, the marching band. <laughs> they actually had a jazz uh, ensemble that he was part of in the Army. Wow. But they were about to, he was also a paratrooper, so they were about to send him to um, Vietnam. And by that time, I had two children with him, Michael and Ananda. Mm -hmm. And um, I was living in the woods in North Carolina, and the post was the you know Fort Campbell was near where I was living, but I lived out in the woods um, by myself with with Michael, and and then Ananda was born, and um, wow. so during that time I started to explore yoga. This was in the I guess it was 1960 around yeah I was exploring yoga reading um, but you know we had no internet everything was you know um, you'd search for a book or you you'd have to go somewhere I wanted to find uh, the Tao Te Ching I remember I somehow I had heard of that and I, I ended up in Nashville looking for it and found it <laughs> in a little bookstore <laughs> one of these little gift things you know so everything was it was very different when you're seeker seeker in those days and um, and I was uh, just, life was un, uh, unfolding and I was young and experimenting. I remember going to a black church one Sunday and it was off the edge of the, the woods where I was living. And I went in and the, the energy was so beautiful and the people were just so alive and, and you know, everyone turned and welcomed me and it was just this beautiful energy. I just, I remember that. And I always felt this real affinity with the music, um, uh, African-American music and also, um, uh, you know, Caribbean music, you know, to the rhythms of that and the, the drums. Yeah. And um, so, and to CG, you know, he was also exploring music more and more. And they, he got word that they were about to ship him to Vietnam. And he hadn't done any combat or any, you know, he, had, he was a paratrooper. But for some reason, his, his platoon or whatever he was connected with, they were about to send him. And what, so, what does yeah. that mean exactly, the, a paratrooper? Okay, he was in the 82nd Airborne Division. And so they jump out of airplanes <laughs> okay, yeah, <laughs> and okay. land in, in combat zones or wherever they're supposed to land. Wow, yeah. So he had that training. And when he was in Germany, he was in the 82nd Airborne. And he, he you know, had a lot of that um, um, experience. But they were about to send him. He was radio reconnaissance. That's, that was his MO, you know, besides yeah. being in the... At that time, though, he was just in the band and he wasn't doing anything related to the military and then suddenly they were telling him he was being sent to Vietnam which by that time we were just so com I was completely against the war yeah. I had even protested on the army post um independent by myself <laughs> oh, and um so when he heard that we decided to pack the car and drive to Canada oh wow which we did wow with well, I had a baby, little tiny one, yeah. Ananda, and then um, Ananda, as you, uh, I learned my pronunciation of Sanskrit, you know, we put our emphasis on the wrong uh, 
um, verb. I mean, um, yeah, the syllable. You say yeah. Ananda. <laughs> it's actually Ananda. Okay. I heard the the so, same is true for Ramana, I believe. We're like yeah, 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 Ramana. yeah. I, used, I probably used to say Ramana. Yeah, right. <laughs> I learned that later, though. But anyway, so we I packed everything up and drove to Canada, to Toronto, and um, we were met by these Quakers who took us into their home and took care of us and helped us get landed immigrant status. Wow. But they had a whole network of people that um, helped the people fleeing the United States at that time. Yeah. So we were there and then we lived with them for six months and then we we established ourselves and 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 then from then on it was just um the ex the uh, i guess the uh, spiritual exploration really started to um develop more and more uh to cg with his music and um i was dancing with with his group but um i also was exploring um both of us together, but really, uh, that's where I found Rama, Ramana and um, uh, Ramakrishna, who, who is also a very uh, big influence for me. Yeah. Um, and I think Ramana was the, the that's the first time I really felt what it was to have a connection to a uh, guru, what that was. Oh, wow. you know, I connected to him spiritually very deeply. And also Ramakrishna which is a very different energy than Ramana, but they were both uh, around the same time, I believe. Yeah, maybe Ramakrishna was before him, but yeah. anyway, so, and then Tasiji's just started musically to, you know, just develop intensely. And I mean, at that time we had Wayne Shorter and I mean, there were, there were just all these incredible musicians coming through Toronto and he started to connect with, with them and, and just, take off with that. And I, um, we just kept going with that and uh, kids were getting older. Then I had another child, my daughter Indigo. And so um, we were there in Toronto for five years. And then he just started feeling it was time to go back to the States. The energy had changed around that and there was more um, opening to people coming back. And there was, um, if, you, if you cross the border on the East Coast or certain areas, you would get arrested <laughs> you were, if you were a deserter. But, there was, but California had a very, the West Coast and, and California, especially Fort Ord had a very open policy taking people back. And so he had to get across the border without getting arrested <laughs> yeah. so we went differently he at that time he was an astrologer so he used this um astrology to determine when to go back wow and he went he he took a train by himself um crossed the border did not get caught went to fort ord and turned himself into the military where he was put into um i guess i guess you would call it the stockade or whatever they call the place where they put you in, they arrest you. Um, but he was given a lawyer and the uh, system found him to be uh, not guilty or they, they, get, they let go his whole, um, he, he actually got an honorable discharge. <laughs> I don't know how the whole thing happened. It was very, very auspicious in a way you could say. So, um, and then I followed him and, and met him in California. We went back to New York. So we were back and forth, New York, California. And that's around, I mean, a lot, I guess I'm kind of just sort of, uh, stories are weird, you know. <laughs> yeah. By that time with three kids, we were living in the Lower East Side. Mm -hmm. um, I had gone to California on my own at times, and we were we were doing a lot of exploration independently, but but always being together in a certain sense. And it is, and so I was in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, and uh, we, I had discovered um, Da Free John at that time. It was Bubba Free John. Actually, I I found him when I was in Vancouver in 1972. I think it was 71 or 72. I found 
his first book. Okay. And well, I and I remember oh. it, that was called The Knee of Listening. Okay, The Knee of Listening. Yeah, and if you read the, it was translate it was rewritten later and Samuel Bonder did a, a you know wrote a lot of it. So that's very different from the original Knee of Listening. Yeah. That was very different, which is more it was biographical. But, but when I read it, I just, and I had felt that I was coming to this, I, I said, I just can't do this spiritual circus anymore. I'd gotten to this point where I couldn't, you know, I just had to drop out of a lot of the seeking that was going on inside of me. And then I, I found this book. <laughs> so that was like, this is it. And I, and actually, I, I remember re, um, actually praying to Rama, Ramana oh, wow. that I wanted a living guru. I wanted someone alive that was that I could go to and spend time with. Oh, wow. So when I read this book, he the first thing when I picked it up, I, I just happened to be standing in the spiritual bookstore in, in Vancouver. And I wasn't interested, I wasn't looking for anything, but I saw this book, I picked it up, started leafing through it and and he, he mentions Ramana in it. And then I saw him, he mentioned Ramakrishna and I thought, wow, this is interesting because those were my two strongest influences. So I started to, uh, I, took, I bought the book and read it cover to cover and felt immediately drawn to him. Wow. But at that time there was, he was in LA at the time, a very small group of people around him and um, I kept it with me. I didn't feel ready with the children and going back to the U.S. and you know to to join anything. <laughs> so for about two years, I I held on to that and I connected with people. But we went back to New York after Tsiji got released from the army, and uh, that's when I was in the Lower East Side. Okay, so my plan was that I was going to go to California and join the community. Oh, that's what they call, you know, his, his community. Yeah. And by that time they were in Northern California. They had bought this land and, and I, I was going to join. I had this incredible dream where I literally, I, I mean, it, it just felt like I met him in this dream. And I was in a, a group of people all around him. And I had this incredible connection to him. So, I knew I was going to go, but I didn't, you know, at that time with three children and, you know, to CG and we, you know, we're in the Lower East Side. So we went away one day to visit his mother in Brooklyn, came back and our apartment had burned down. I mean, burnt, it, it was a tenement flat, you know, one of those railroad, they call them railroad flats in, uh, I don't know if you've ever been to New York, but they have a railroad flat is like, um, the tenement buildings are usually four three, four, five stories high. It's just stairway, there's no elevator. And they're old, they're very old. And the east side, uh, you know, Lower East Side is an old area. Wow. And so the buildings are very close to each other and they're they're not big, they're sort of yeah. smaller. Yeah. And it, it just, I uh, guess some flames, had, these kids lighted a fire and these flames got up and caught our, our, our um, apartment uh, window, something on the window and just, ripped through the entire apartment, everything was gone. And except we had a neighbor <laughs> who climbed in the fire escape and rescued the guitar and amplifier to CG's guitar and amplifier. Whoa. So the only thing that was left was the guitar and amplifier. Whoa. And, you know, we walked, I looked at it and I just thought, the fire must have its way. That was like something that I remembered from um, Bubba, Bubba Freejohn's book and um, something he had said. So I just looked at CJ, I said, let's go to California. And so we did, we got in the, we had a van at the time, like a, you know, a, we had to push start it because <laughs> the battery didn't work. <laughs> but, but we, <laughs> we got, we got, we got across country, you know, with, some breakdowns and so on, but we got across country, um, went to San Francisco and um, I joined the community, started, um, you know, 
I went to the sanctuary and actually the the first time, I, well, I started doing this on my own. CG was not as drawn to it as I was. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was really going more on my own. I think he went a couple of times, but he wasn't drawn in the same way I was. And so I, um, the first time I went, there was a big party going on. Now, I don't know if you know the story about Bova Free John, Da Free John, Adi Da, <laughs> who has many names. But we went, he went, his teaching went through a lot of stages all the time. And during those stages, there were periods of time when there was a lot of partying going on, intense right. partying. And other times was intense disciplined sadhana. So it wasn't as if we were all just partying all the time, but yeah. I arrived during the party and I was invited over to his, his place. And I um, had the experience of the exact dream that I had it, when I lived in the Lower East Side, when I walked through the gate and into the, it was like I was reliving this dream. It was exact. Whoa. And I ended up, um, you know, spending a lot of time with him then. Yeah. And um, what was your first impression when you were with him in person? Was it? Was that, that actually like? wasn't the first time I saw him. When I saw him, I, I was completely blown away by him. Just, yeah. It, it was very, very strong effect. He had city, as they call it, you know, this energy. And it was very, and, and of course, you know, the circumstance too um, was very intense, but yeah, I felt, I felt that, yeah, very powerful, very powerful. And um, I tend to be a very low key person, but, <laughs> the, you know, I don't, yeah, it, he was a powerful presence. And I fell in love with him, you know, and just, uh, you know, completely was, that's all I wanted to do was be there. Yeah. And then to CG uh, didn't want to stay. He wanted to go back to the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, this is a whole other story, but I had gotten a, a, um, insurance on his guitars about a week before our apartment burned down. Because our neighbor, who is one of one of the musicians that he played with, um, not the one that rescued his guitar, but he lived across the street. He was a, a saxophone player. His uh, instruments had been stolen. And, uh, you know, this was about a week before this happened. And I thought, you know, we should get insurance. And so I called and it just took a day. You know, you just call and the, you have insurance. Whoa. So so his his um so we actually had apartment insurance and so we got enough money to when we got to california by that time we got the money and we bought a, a truck you know like a, a bigger van okay. he took that and drove back to new york with the kids and i stayed in the community da free john's community for about eight years and uh to cg was puerto rican and they love children there's never you can't have enough children. <laughs> uh -huh. And I was very, uh, I was, you know, just um, his mother, his, his aunts, uncles, grandparents, everybody is just, it's an, a real extended family. And they just, you know, helped him and took care of them. And I stayed in California and he started to really develop his music and also started teaching himself, you know, teaching spirituality in his his own teaching yeah and um so i lived there for eight years practiced had many experiences did many things um and at a certain point i felt that i needed to leave and i there that's a whole you know conver you know what was going on with me in terms of my um relationship to the community to adi da to the to the practice, to what he was teaching. That's a whole other conversation, but I left mm -hmm. and um, went back east, back and forth, traveled, lived in West Virginia for a while. I, I mean, I was always moving, <laughs> you know, my whole life. I've never lived in, I, I must've lived like, like 200 places. I mean, I always moved places. This, place. this, and this is a similar um, description of UG, who you're going to get to at some point, but because like UG never lived in any one place for very long as well, right? 
Yeah, but he had roots that were really strong in India. Okay. I think for me, it was just like, um, yeah, but when he, he did travel a lot. Yeah, he moved around a lot. That's yeah. all he did, really. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was moving and changing. and But I um, went back to New York and um, uh, then I just started to, I don't know. I mean, there have been other influences, but I would say that from that from that point, um, the next the next feeling for me was more <clears throat> that there was a, there was no way to find this truth. That whatever that was, I was seeking the seeker, the one seeking it, was obstructing. And anything that was told to me to do this, to do that, was, it was an illusion. It was obstructing whatever that was that I was looking for, that truth, you know. And um, so I had, I, um, at some point, read, come across Yuji. I also came across uh, Bernadette Roberts, who I really, uh, there was a, a real interest in her. But um, when, when, I, when I found Yuji, I, I think that that was the, the um, strongest of all the relate, I wouldn't even say it was a relationship <laughs> in a way. I mean, I was with him, I spent a lot of time with him, but, yeah. but it was, something else going on because by that time I had really burned out the whole, all the practices, the yoga, the meditation, I had burned all of those things out. Mm -hmm. And it was like being uh, just like, there was nothing there anymore, you know, the seeking aspect. And yet there I was with Yuji and he was, he was also talking about that. So, um, so that's, you know, I, I would say that was the end of the search in that way. So that was the uh, culmination of that type of seeking that, you know, really intense uh, practices, believing in, in um, you know, all the, all the belief systems, you know, whatever, whatever it was that I, that one was to do. It seemed like, yes, we, we, there's something in you that feels that you need to do something to get something. And um, you used to say that uh, the hot, the, the, that what you want is pleasure without pain, right. and that the highest pleasure is God, or you know, the highest pleasure is this idea of enlightenment. Right, right. You know, right. and so the seeking is just another form of pleasure seeking. The spiritual seeking, you're seeking something that's going to. For me, a lot of it too is about having some knowledge that would over what kind of encompass everything you know that it would be more like a state than a, than knowing something but but this condition this state of uh awakening or whatever you know where you would just be um completely aware of this no self that's you know just this right but that it would be something that you would be aware of <laughs> right, right, right. Uh -huh. right. Yeah. And I think Yuji kind of, I don't know, he just wiped the whole thing clean in a sense. And uh, I had no idea what I was doing or why I was, you know, I mean, why I, I was going to see him or spend time with him. I just know it was like a moth, you know, going, going to the fire. And um, so. <laughs> wow. Well. It's interesting because once you get to Yuji, it, it's almost like the story stops because the seeking that you describe stops. You know, this you identify at that point, you identified the seeking as being the obstacle. And so then, how, but there's still a story that continues. You know, you had many interactions with Yuji and you traveled with him for a whole year at one point, right? Or, yeah. 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 And, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So by the time I met Yuji, it was 
I think it was 1991 or two that when I met him, mm -hmm. but I had been reading his book for about three, you know, I came across his book about three years before that in the eighties. And I didn't do anything, you know, but it, it just affected me. But then at a certain point, I decided to write a letter to the editor of the Mystique of Enlightenment, which was the first book. I think I have a first edition of that. So um, that was his first book. Yeah, the Mystique of Enlightenment. Okay. Yeah. Did he yeah. write that, or was that someone else? He never wrote writing? any books. He never wrote any books. Nothing. No so writing. who was involved in making that book? Do you know? Um, I have it in my bookshelf. <laughs> oh, it's it's not that important. Yeah, it it's uh, it was it was. Um, I think, you know, all his books are um, transcripts of, he would just talk to people. They would come visit him. Yeah. And so this, I think most of the mystique uh, was was probably transcribed in uh, Europe. Okay. When he would go to Gestad a lot. And um, so I think that's where it mostly happened. But I can, I can send you that information. Gestad, what country is that? It's Switzerland. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I wrote to the editor mm -hmm. and I said, I would like to meet Yuji Krishnamurti. Mm -hmm. And I, a few months went by and I got a, a, um, a letter by this person named Chandra Shekhar. And in the letter, he said, you, your letter arrived on Yuji's birthday. No. So, wow. you know, with Indians, they're very, yeah, that's auspicious. Right? <laughs> uh, like and um, if you want to, if you want to um, find out about Yuji, there's a woman, Julie Thayer, who lives in, uh, she, he gave me her phone number. Mm -hmm. I called her and she lived about three blocks from me on the Upper West Side of Manhattan at the time. Mm -hmm. I was living, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Three months to get the letter, and then she's three blocks away. Yeah, and she had just she she met Yuji around in the late eighties, you know. So she had when she met him, she met him in California. She had been with Andrew Cohen, and she met him and just walked out of Andrew's ashram with with Andrew's mother as well. <laughs> the two of them went to visit Yuji, and just that was it. But she she ended up. Um, really befriending, you know, becoming his friend. And he, they traveled together for about two years. She, she was a photographer. So she took almost all these great pictures that you see of Yuji, that's Julie. And all these videos that you see on Yuji, most of them are, are Julie. Okay. And she carried this huge video camera around because that's what video cameras in those days were. Right. And, and went all over with him and Actually, one of the, well, in any case, uh, all over the world with him and took videos everywhere they went. So I just became friends with her and, and um, got to see all these videos of Yuji. And then about a month after I met her, one or two months, uh, he came to California. And so I, I wanted to go. So I, we flew to uh, San Rafael and that's where he was at the time. And that's the first time I met him. And uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you, and you have a funny um, story of the first time you met when he asked you, you read his, his book, Why Are You There? Or something like this. Yeah, right? yeah. So I walked in the door, was, he was staying in this motel that he usually stayed at. And I uh, walked in the door and I looked at him. I said, oh, you, you, um, yeah, he said to me, why are you here? <laughs> why, did, <laughs> why did you come? What do you, why are you here? Well, first I said, hi, Yuji. Yeah. He said, why are you here? I said, well, I read your book and I really wanted to meet you. And uh, he said, well, if you understood what I was saying in that book, you'd throw it in the garbage and you'd never come here. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, thank you. And sat down. <laughs> yeah. And... Um, he just, you know, immediately, I mean, I just couldn't, I just watched how he moved, how he, fun, you know, how he functioned, his movement and his, 
it was so different from anything I had ever experienced. You know, I'd been with Da Frida and it's, it's like all bowing and beloved and, you know, it, it was so bhakti, you know, all this, uh, you know, the guru and yeah. I, with Yuji, it was just like, um, so completely different. There was no, well, in, in Zen, they call it the stink of enlightenment, you know, the, the whole, you know, when you're around this enlightened being and they're radiating all this energy around Yuji, it was just this, um, none of that. And yet the, the energy was really intense, but it wasn't like he was giving the spiritual energy at all, you know, and he, he was so relaxed and so, I remember he went into the kitchen to get himself, you know, some water or something. And so he got up from his chair and I don't know if you've ever heard of Douglas Rosestone, but his, 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 he, he was with Adi Da too at one time, but he knew Yuji. He was the person that, that Yuji called when he was going through his calamity. Wow. Oh, okay. So Douglas and I, I knew Douglas from, from, you know, but he, he um his wife was there visiting and when yuji walked into the kitchen yeah. she sat in his chair she just sat down she popped herself down and you know <laughs> you and i'm just watching observing all this yuji came back from the kitchen and sat down on the coffee table <laughs> you know? and there was like nothing in him no response to that but to me that this was just such a sign of something very very different you know because of the, and, and also the other thing, I don't know if you've read Yuji's books, you know, the, dis the, the disclaimer in the beginning of his books. Right, yeah, for, for our audience, um, what, what's the Yeah, it, well, this is a book I did on Yuji, actually. <laughs> okay. I wrote, I, I, I published a book, but the first thing he says on all the books, it's in all the books. Yeah. I will, I love this. So, because this is the first thing I read and I was so impressed because I have to find it because it was the opposite of what I had been through. Right? Mm -hmm. My teaching, if that is a word you want to use, has no copyright. You are free to reproduce, distribute, interpret, misinterpret, distort, garble, do what you like, even <laughs> claim authorship do, without my consent or the permission of anybody. <laughs> wow. That's what Yuji put in the, that's, that's the only thing he wrote that's in the books, every book. He said, this is, this, there's no copyright. So- um, what, is that, what is that book that you published by you two? It's called the, uh, the Courage to Stand Alone. So I have actually Non-Duality Press um, published it. Okay. Too. The you, same book. And that's Julie's photograph, by the way. And also on the back, that's Julie's photograph in India. It's beautiful. It's, yeah, it's beautiful. Um, yeah. So, you know, when I saw him walk, you know, when I read that disclaimer, that, that was, you know, the first thing when I found his book, actually, it had been in San Rafael originally, too. Um, that was a thing that I saw, and I just was like, ah, oh, just total, this relief, you know. <laughs> and so to see him function in the way he was, just that total simplicity and grace you know uh, call it a grace and and the way he moved i i always thought it was like a cat you know just that that movement the way he moved and he um he just uh you know so this was the kind of thing and then they all went out to um get his hair cut and i stayed there in the hotel room and these two people were there they they lived in a van and they were very, they were almost like, they seemed crazy, you know, like psychotic kind of. Ah, okay. <laughs> but they knocked on the door and I opened the door and, and, and they said, uh, is Yuji here? And I said, well, he went out. And so I let them in and they sat there and, and then Yuji came back and, you know, it was just every, the people would come and go and you could, you didn't have to, um, come at a certain, you know, he, later on, he would say, come, come in the afternoon, because we may be out, you know, but there was no, um, you didn't have to, uh, you could just come and you could go, <laughs> you know, there was like, it was just like going to visit your grandmother and sitting in her living room, you know, you, you, you come and you visit and you leave. And that's what it was like. There was no um, formality to it. Yeah. At one point, a lot of, um, Andrew's 
devotees came to visit him. You know, mm. We called them androids. <laughs> so ah. they, they came to visit him. When he was in San Rafael, this, I think it was a, the same visit. Um, might have, But anyway, uh, they came in with flowers, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and he just like, don't give me, he didn't want anyone to give him flowers, you know. Mm. He said that leave them outside, they, they belong in the ground, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, mm. so um, yeah, so that impressed me. And then anytime he, well, so then um, I went to Gestad, you know, uh, to, to see him because he would usually go there every summer. And then um, wherever he was, you know, uh, in, in the US, whenever he came, he came to New York a lot as well. And um, so over the years, I visited him a lot. And I, I did this book when I was working at a law firm I transcribed uh, these tapes. They're actually from Amsterdam. Okay. He had a he had this Hank was a, a friend of his Hank Schoenfeld. Um, he taped. This was in 1988, I believe. He taped these um, cassette tapes of UG, and he called them "Give Up." That was what he called the tapes. And yeah. um, so when I read when I listened to these tapes, I thought, "Oh, this would be." I, I loved listening to them. So I thought these were really great conversations he had um, with these people in Amsterdam. You know, it's like when, when you interview someone, sometimes some people that interviewed him, they, I just see they bring something out in him, you know? And so these were really good. And I, um, wow. the sound quality is also good. You can actually hear the, this um, on uh, YouTube. Really? You know? Yeah. Yeah. But I decided, but that time we didn't have YouTube then. So I decided to transcribe these tapes and I did it. I was working in a law firm and I was, um, I had transcription, you know, I could do. So I was, I was transcribing UG's <laughs> talks in this law firm. And my boss was just, you know, when I, if I had, I, he, he knew about UG, so I, cause I told him about him, but I would answer the phone and do my job. But every chance I got, I'd be transcribing. And I did this and then Julie and I um, had it published at Autonomedia. Autonomedia in Brooklyn it was this anarchist press. They, okay. they, they published all these anarchy books on anarchy. Yeah. And, and so we brought the, the transcript, they liked it and they published it. So uh, that was, uh, you know, that was, uh, <laughs> anyway. Sure. So later on, um, many things that happened around UG, but mostly um, I didn't have any sense that there was a reason I went or I was going to get anything. It was just, just yeah. to be, you know, to be with him as a friend, you know, and um, good company. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah, UG. Yeah, who? So, yeah, gosh, I mean, it's a lot, you know, but I guess the journey from Adi Da, well, from let's say you found Ramana and Ramakrishna to Adi Da to UG, is there a sense of a common thread or is it all just not so important? It's just what appears. Well, it isn't, it, yeah, it's not so important, but, but in a sense, there was some part of me because I wasn't raised in any religion, but I had I had this sense that and and I think LSD also has did a lot of this to a lot of people. But it's hard to say if there's any cause and effect, right? Right. right. You know, because I was already seeking before any psychedelics. Yeah. But there's a sense that there's a state, a condition, right? That you could. Um, that was natural, but at the same time, it's covered over, like there's right. a veil. Right. And right. that if if somehow maybe there was something you could do that would, you know, <laughs> lift that veil, you know, yeah. which is why the seeking starts because and and you know you want to be around people that perhaps are functioning in that state. Right. And there's a sense, and it's given throughout the traditions as well, that being in that company can transmit 
some of that to you. Right. Yeah. So that that does lead to the seeking, you know. Yeah, that, that's it's even the literal translation of the word the Upanishads, I believe. It just means to be sitting in the presence of a sage or yeah, and in, in the in Hinduism, that's a big, yeah, that's very strong, you, you know. I would say it's strong in every religion, every traditional religion, but it's very, very strong in Hinduism. And in India, India is so spiritual, everything is spiritual. You used to call it the spiritual shit land. Yeah. Because it was just everything was spiritual, yeah. you know. Um, and the, they have uh, the tradition of the guru but but guru could be any teacher like your dance teachers your guru your music teachers your guru you yeah. know and and um but if you want to go to someone to learn something you go to your guru it could be someone teaching you music you know it could be somebody teaching you how to cook yeah. you know but if you're going for spiritual for enlightenment yeah. You go to the sat guru. You go to the person that is in that condition that yeah. can can lead you through it. Yeah. And there's a sadhana. There's a practice. All yeah. of that. Yeah. But usually, did he was he he fits into a different framework within that Hinduism, which is why when you're in India with him, it was so interesting because the people have such a sense of you know him fitting into the framework of their tradition, which yeah. he kind of does as, as a Gyani or a Shiva. They, a lot of them, you know, think of him as Shiva, which is the destroyer, you know? Right, right, right. Yeah. And they, even when he's there, it, it's just, you know, you're, you're in this, the place where he was born and, and where he was most influenced. And he relaxes into that, but there was never a sense where he, he would change or, say you know that he was a guru or that you know he was enlightened he never would say he was enlightened he said he detested that word yeah. he, i am not an enlightened man <laughs> you know, i'd rather be i'd rather be called a criminal than an enlightened man you know he didn't it, i think he was always tearing down the holy cow the holy anything you know he was yeah. always tearing things down but there is a tradition in, in, in India where that fits into it. And um, he also, so he still, you know, he, but there was something about that uh, where people would come and sit with him there or be with him. Never said, Sat, I'm sitting satsang, never did that. <laughs> Don't say, you know, but people would come to visit him, see him and, and spend time. Yeah. And and it would just be so beautiful, <laughs> you know? People would sing and carry on and laugh and cry and, you know, argue with him or, you know, worship him, whatever, you know, whatever was going on. It was, it was very, very beautiful. And this was late in his life when I was there with him in India. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, with UG. yeah, I, well, you know, I, it makes me think of, um, I guess, Nisargadatta was known to do this as well in his own way, where, you know, it's said that his most common response to people was to yell out the word concept, concept, no matter what they said. And, and yet, you know, people could sort of take things that he say now, you know, that he said, and um, create a dogma out of it. And I'm sure even now people could do that with Yuji's words. I think people try to do that with everything. That's what, the, that's what the, 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 you know, the brain does. Yeah. You, whatever you, well, you know, if you're thinking about something like um, you wanna learn how to dance or play music or cook or, you know, yeah. do algebra, you know, yeah. <laughs> you, you, there's a function for learning that. But he said that there's no function for learning anything that's this abstraction, these ideas of God and truth and enlightenment. And right. said there's, there's no way to learn that. Right. It's almost, it's like the opposite, it's unlearning. And, and so, but, but he said, but people can't, they have to put me into a framework. Yeah. That's all they can do. Yeah. So it reminds me of the Tao Te Ching, or he reminds me of this, or he's, he's Shiva, or he's this. They, they can't do anything but that. 
Right. You know, but I'm not saying any of that. Right. I'm throwing, there is nothing to <laughs> any of this, nothing. Right. But it doesn't mean that they won't do that. And I see it all the time, you know. So and I guess because I had such a, uh, yeah, I was with, being with Adi Da, you know, just, uh, we also studied all the traditions. We did a, a lot of practices and meditation and sadhana and yoga. I think because I had done all that, I kind of, you know, and then left it, left it behind, walked away from it. Yeah. I didn't want to make Yuji into that. I had already gone, done the guru thing, you know, I had done that. I didn't, I didn't want that with him. And he never wanted, it, it never gave me any impression that he wanted to be that as well, you know. Okay. Do you think, did he ever use the word ordinary? That's the word some people use, that it's just ordinary. Well, Da Frijan used that word when he, the first book, the first thing I noticed, he said, it's an, or, it's an ordinary, pleasurable life ordinary the man of understanding it's ordinary but then he went on to become very extraordinary yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and the practice became more and more a practice an extraordinary you know it started out as a self-inquiry but it became oh, the most amazing you know but you Eugene didn't use the word ordinary because he never he, the only thing he said about what happened to him he just the natural state was what what he said this is the nat this is the, a na the natural state but then he later said he was sorry he said that because um and actually he said this to me he said i'm sorry i used that term because now they're making that into something right you know but um how do you get there to the natural yeah like the natural state right yeah. And so then, as, and he said, this isn't a state. <laughs> it's not a state. There's no, but what he said was, it was like a, um, when, when he had his calamity, what happened for him was that everything that every man, woman, and child ever thought, felt, and experienced was flushed out of the system, like a vacuum, just gone, just flushed out. And if you think what that is, it's, it's just all the ideas, the thoughts, the feelings, the everything, that's in our DNA, just gone. That's nothing, no, no thing, <laughs> the end, you know? Yeah. And, and yet um, this body kept, you know, he could speak, he could talk, he could walk, he, <laughs> he could function, mm -hmm. you know? But he said all of those abstractions, all of those thoughts and ideas, that we're that we're talking about that we're looking for that we want yeah that cannot be given cannot be taught it is not anything that you can get or give yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, so, so from your own personal journey from seeker to maybe no longer seeker, if that's fair to say? Yeah, yeah it's fair to say. <laughs> what, what, what would you say to um, other people who feel very viscery like they are seeking now? What, what would you say? That's great. <laughs> Fun. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy it, yeah. Enjoy it, yeah. 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 yeah you, you, well, I mean, you, the traditions are full of incredible things. You can experience all kinds of things, you know, until that no longer, you know, I, I think we were talking about before the thread. The thread in me was always that, I think the thread was always no self, even when I was young, you know, 10 or 11. Wow. <laughs> Just that somehow this wasn't it. You know, yeah. But I don't think I could really verbalize that then or understand it. What was the? But I was attracted to it. You know, there was something attracting me to that. It's like a radical kind of thing. You know, and it's in. You know, you can find it in the traditions, as yeah. well. You know, so it's not as if it's not there, it's, lurking. It's, a, <laughs> it, it's in all of them, isn't it? It's it's when you get to the point where you're when it, it's it's it, 
I don't know if it's in all of them. It is the, uh, I don't like, it's not goal, but it is the, it's the truth of it all. Right, right. That's there, you know. Right. Yeah. Like Tony calls it the, the open secret, you know. It's, it's that. Yeah, yeah, just right under your nose the whole time, kind of. Yeah. What, what's the, uh, so when you were 10 or 11, what was that like? What, how would, what was the, what's the memory of a sense of that at 10 or 11? I think it's like when you, when you start to, um, first, first of all, you, you start to sense that you're suffering. Yeah. You know, and even in simple things, not, and not just that you're suffering, but that life is, is suffering. Wow. You see, you see things, you know, and you experience things. For for me, I'm just, I don't know, if, but but there's that sense, and so, what is that? You know, that question of what is that? You know, why are people sad? Why do they suffer? You know, why why don't they love? You know, what what is that? You know. Yeah. That's why a... are there poor people? Why do people hate each other? You know. Why do they discriminate? Why don't, you know, why can't, you know, all of those, those feelings, like just the questioning and what is, what it, that sense of life that that isn't, that isn't true, you know, what, right. what they're, what, what the humans, you know, what they're doing, you know, just, uh, I, you know, what, one of the, th when UG had, had his calamity, he said it was what's left is, a smooth functioning machine but he also said it's like an animal yeah just just that just that smooth functioning machine the body it's beautiful. Just, yeah, yeah yeah and there was a sense of that and also the, just the sadness you know that just that suffering the sense of the suffering and and the inquiry is into that and then, you know, so then you, you get answers from, from religions. Yeah. You might feel connected to some of those answers. Like you'll get an answer. Um, I had, a, I wasn't, I, I was running away from home when I was about 10. Oh, wow. And um, I had this Puerto Rican girlfriend next door uh -huh. named Dinah Martinez. I never forget her. <laughs> uh -huh. So she saw me running and down the road. She said, where are you going? I said, I'm running away from home, you know. So, you know, I can't, I'm, I was very sad. She wow. said, well, let me walk with you. So we were walking and um, we passed a church. And in those, and then Brooklyn, you know, beautiful, big Catholic churches, you know, and um, no, no locks on the door in those days. And uh, she said, let's go in, let's go in. So I said, okay. So we went inside and I sat down and I, I didn't know anything. I don't think I had ever been in a church before. Wow. <laughs> and I just felt so filled with love and, and peace. Everything just washed away, you know, all of the sense of the suffering and the sadness and, you know, whatever, whatever was going on with me just fell away. Wow. And I just said, okay, I'm ready to go home. You know, we turned around and I walked home. And so I always remember that because it was like, uh, so I never, you know, I just felt like, uh, I know a lot of people have experiences, you know, growing up Catholic. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because you know, so not you know, not all, but you know, so many people that grew up Catholic had bad experiences, and right, you know, right, yeah. Right. But um, for me, that was there was something in that space that was, uh, you know, really profound and and healing, you know, a healing that. But you know, so I I have a great respect for for you know the traditions in a certain way you know i understand what they mean like an empathy because i know what it is to be a bhakti yeah i know the yogas you know i know what it is to be a jnani i know what all of all of those yogas what they are yeah because i i went through it i felt it i experienced it but i also know that there's that all of the traditions um become a dogma you know they they become that but also no self 
it doesn't it's it's it comes it doesn't even matter if you're in a tradition yeah there's anyone that i that i like bernada ug the people yeah. that i feel um really represent this and and tony for instance yeah just say uh, basically this is a what what can what comes this falling away of the self if you want to put it in those terms or whatever terms it's a causal it doesn't come about because of this or that or i did this or that or yeah. you know it's just what is and that's that's it yeah, I, so, I remember yeah. the first time um, I was working at a health food store in Houston and a friend of mine told me about UG. It was like in the early days of YouTube, he told me to take a look at it. And I looked him up and the first thing I remember seeing him say on YouTube was that there is no enlightenment and whatever happened to me is a causal and I can't tell you how to get it. And I remember just thinking, well, why am I watching this guy? <laughs> and I, right. And, and, and I, and it just seemed absurd to me. I said, okay, well, good for you, dude. Like, but you know, I, I want, if it sounds pretty good, what you have, but, I want to know how to get it. Yeah. And, and then, but I, another thing is he would say, um, <laughs> I can't give it, Yeah. you know, there's nothing to get. I, and no, and I can't give it. And if I can't give it, then nobody can, <laughs> you know, it's like, it, it would cover all, <laughs> all the bases, you know, I can't give it. Nobody can. <laughs> Yeah. It's interesting because he there is a story that's I don't know if you ever hold, heard him told this tell this story personally or if this is just an, someone else I don't know if it's an accurate quote or not but is it true that he met Ramana Maharshi at some point when he was younger Yeah yeah prior, prior to his calamity mm -hmm. and he asked Ramana um you know can you give me enlightenment or can you give me what you have or something like this right Yeah he said what what you have is that something you can give? Yeah. And, and then, he said, and, and Ramana, Ramana said, um, I can give it, can you take it? Yeah. And that pissed him off. <laughs> he yeah. said, if I can't take it, nobody can. <laughs> but he said the arrogance, <laughs> he walked away. And, and he always says the only reason he went was because people kept telling him you have to go see R Ramana. Yeah. And he was born. He was born and raised in South India around all of that, you know, the Vedanta Society and all of the, you know, um, J. Krishnamurti. You know, they were. He knew him really well. You know, mm -hmm. um, so, you know, he he went, but um, yeah, he didn't go as a humble seeker. <laughs> and he also did a lot of yoga, you know, and he he did a lot before you know so on and so forth but he was always ruthless like just this kind of ruthless person just really uh right because he was nothing would, sentimental you know, about him right because yeah. I, I from what i read you know after he would go to these he wouldn't necessarily even attend the jay krishnamurti talks all the time but he would be hanging out afterwards and he would be in the vicinity and then people would ask him they'd want to he, he, he would always just challenge whatever people would say or whatever Jay Krishnamurti said, you know, just. Yeah, there, there was an influence there, but when he, when he threw that all out of his system, it all goes. And he said, you, you have, everything has to go. And he said, in, including me, he would say to us, you know, including me, everything has to go. Yeah. You know, that, that, like, that's in, you know, you'll find that in, in Zen, they say, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. Right. You know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's got to go. Yeah. It, yeah. Just, uh, well, it will go when yeah. you die, <laughs> whether, whether you yeah. die and this body continues to function or you, you know, at, at the end of your days, you know, yeah. it will go. Yeah. So there's no, no hurry. No, no, don't, don't get your pants in a bunch about it. You just, you know, it's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, you know, some people say um, that you can't want, you don't really want this. You think like Tim Kliss has described, you know, he thought he wanted it. And then he went through this three or four months of his version of a calamity where it was tremendous. I don't know, just mm -hmm. negative emotion, maybe. I, I'm not sure yeah. what he did exactly, but, you know, he said he didn't want it. He thought he wanted it. And once it, 
you know, things started to fall away, so to speak. It, it, he said it's something that nobody would want for, and that was his experience of it. What did, did you go through? Any oh, you just said the same thing. You would never want this. You would yeah. never, you, you know, but I think also the way Tim's saying it, I like that because um, the you yeah. does not want to die. Right. Somebody said, you're going to die, but it's not just figuratively speaking, you will <laughs> die, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. No, I don't want to die, you know? So, so then it, it, it's uh, with this whole, um, right now, it seems a non-duality or what they, I don't like even using that term that much, but right. well, Eugene also never said this is non-duality, nothing. But uh, that's in Advaita, you know, that's, that's um, you know, right. part of that tradition. Yeah. But um, this is that's... the meaning of it. it Advaita translated means non-duality. Basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but uh, it, it, it is, but then again, you'll have the non-duality where they're talking about um, realizing Mm. The self and and so there's yeah. something you do to realize if you turn to that you turn to the guru you know there's always something that has to be done and in the sense that tony's talking about it i think it's it's at the at the mm. where it's that is what is there's not there's that is really non-duality <laughs> Because the other is not conditional non-duality in a sense. Yeah. You know, there's some things that you can do to get that, and that you, you know. But then there's the um, when this happens, it's not because you were doing anything, so you got it, and it was you that got something, and you know. So that puts it, and then that creates a very funny kind of dilemma because when we want to talk about, because we do want to talk about it, right? We're talking, yeah, but when yeah. you start to talk about it, you're just, um, you just come to this, this no thing, this, just this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Gosh, well, yeah, my, part of my own journey with um, Ramana Maharshi was someone that introduced me to all of this, really, and, you know, and I, I, I found the book on um, Be As You Are, which is an edited together compilation of things he said, um, and this is a bit off topic, but just sharing a bit. Oh, no, no, yeah. But, you know, it's, the book is, I, I realized eventually that David Godman, the one who edited together, he arranged it in a way where the first chapter is kind of the most simple, direct pointers in a sense. And then as you go to the back of the book, by the end of it, it's his question and answers on reincarnation and karma and like, you know, how the universe was created, you know, which were things he never wanted to talk about, but he was sort of, he, he basically said that he would answer anyone's question, you know, at the level that they were asking it if they weren't ready for this sort of like hardcore non-duality or direct teaching of it's just this already. The first chapter of that book, and when I first started reading that book, I was more fascinated by the end of the book where it got into all these things about karma and reincarnation and samadhi experiences and all this stuff. And and now I, I can't really stand reading that stuff too much because it just doesn't ring true for me. It feels like misdirection in a way and, and the simplicity of just, um, you know, this is, like you said, it's just this and there's nothing to get to and the practices at a certain point get in the way almost, um, if you feel like they're necessary, unless that's just what's happening and it feels yeah. good, it's not wrong to do them either. It's just- Yeah, no, sure, whatever, that's, you. If, if you do yoga or you meditate, if you feel that that, you wanna do it, do it, Yeah. personally. <laughs> I don't do shit. That's yeah. anything. But that's just because I'm really lazy. You know? <laughs> well, you, well, you've also been a dancer and a dance teacher. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I feel like, you know, and I, I make music and, and make art sometimes and those sorts of activities. I love it. I mean, anything creative or even this conversation, there's a creative aspect to just, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's like play or something. 
Yeah. What when you're talking about um, Ramana, that that brings up um, the the sense of well, you know, Adi Da had these six stages or seven stages, right? And the sixth okay. stage. So it within the the Vedanta tradition. Yeah. That that um, the non duality, you know, yeah. Vedanta. That that that's um, conditional because it depends on the self doing something to right. realize. Yeah. So you're turning. You you try you're trying to find what you know. Who am I? Who am I? And when they say I, that that self is a capital S self. That you know. But it's still you that is turning to that, you that is inquiring, you, you know. So I think what Tony brings and Yuji and what is just to, is, is that's, you know, that you is letting that kind of just go. Yeah. Not, not that you can even do that. But you, something in that you, you just suddenly, or I don't know, suddenly, but you, it's just, it dissolves in a sense. And I think a lot of it is um, wearing, your, you wear yourself down with seeking. Right. You know? Maybe you need to go through some things to wear yourself down, or maybe you wear yourself down because you take drugs, or you wear yourself down because you're working like a maniac, and suddenly one day you just like, uh. so yeah. whatever it is in life, it just wears you down. But at a certain point, if that's gonna, ha if that falls away, that sense before you're physically dead, that's just something that could happen to anyone, anywhere, anytime. There's yeah. no, yeah. There's no litmus test or, or idea that this you have to do A, B, C. And I know, I don't know if you ever watched Buddha at the Gas Pump. You ever watch those interviews? Yes, yes. Okay. So Rick Archer, I think he always tries to, he brings it, whoever he's interviewing, mm -hmm. it's so important to him to point out how important it is to do sadhana, you know, for any enlightenment, for any um, realization that, everybody that comes to that has done some sadhana and and so it's very important yeah. and yet everyone that i really um come to you know feel has that connection says it's not it's not it's a causal it doesn't happen because i did this this and this <laughs> right it doesn't it doesn't happen because but there is this apparent paradox where for instance, when you tell your story, you were drawn to this, that, and the other, and this long journey that's set with all these synchronicities, which you could say are a-causal and don't mean anything, but it's, but it's such a beautiful story. And, and you went through this whole, with Adi Da, you, you experienced, you know, great, you know, like all of the partying and also all of the hardcore studying and practicing of different things. And, and it, yeah, well, there, there's this thing that people say sometimes. It's almost like you have to, I, I forget how the saying goes. I always forget this one, but it's like hitting your head against the wall to like feel the re, the pleasure of the relief of stopping hitting your head against the wall. It's yeah, crack, crack, that, it, it's almost like that or something, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but then you wouldn't be interviewing some guy who, you know, is sitting... <laughs> in a gutter you know drunk and yet maybe maybe that's what it took you know <laughs> you know that's a, that's a good point i mean you, how many you, billions of people are on the earth you know it's yeah. like and if this is our natural state and our natural condition then you have to assume that it comes around you know at least no, i don't no. you have, don't have to assume anything but you know no, i do no. i kind of <laughs> emerson has this um friend he's mentioned um to me where, you know, this person doesn't really want to speak publicly about it, but he, um, you know, he just, yeah, he just, he lives on an island and he has his own experience of what the ocean and nature means to him. And it's, it's very simple. It's just this without much, any desire to talk about it or, you know, try to learn what people are calling it as non-duality or any, he doesn't care about any of that, but he, but he's living, yeah, you could say in this natural way, you know? Yeah, and I know people that have never done any, any sadhana whatsoever, any practice, and yeah. don't go to church, and yet, 
you know, when you talk to them, that's there. Yeah, exactly. You know? it, that, because it's really not not there with yeah, anything. Yeah, right, right. Anything. And also, like, if you're into science and you're studying, you know, just the universe, right? how completely, <laughs> you know, chaotic and, you yeah. know, mysterious it is, you know, that you could just come to that absolutely or if you're an artist you're dancing and suddenly there's you're there's no one dancing the da you know you're being danced right. you know yeah and no yeah. matter which direction you look there's right. there's an in there's an infinity there there's no bottom in that direction it's just a a flow apparent for, for lack of a better word and you you mentioned bernadette roberts and not too many i think a lot of people probably aren't familiar with her so she she has sort of like a non-dual Christian. Um, well, don't call it non-dual because she would never. <laughs> well, well, she, let me yeah, talk about Bernadette. I really love Bernadette. Well, she's I'll, like I'll, she's <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll let you I'll let you describe Bernadette, but um, please yeah. Yeah 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 yeah. She came along. Um, it was one of those things you know where you just find a book on a shelf somewhere and and start <laughs> reading it and it's like ah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I went into a state when I read her book. The first book, I think, was The Path of No Self, and okay. then The Experience of No Self, which is an, an unfortunate title. <laughs> right, right. <'Cause laughs> but, but she, the even, she even says that. And then her last, the other one is uh, What is Self, right? Okay. But she had no background. She was a Catholic. She was a Carmelite nun. She left the cloister. She became a nun very young. And then she left the cloister because she felt at a certain point that she had um, that the, the union is which, you know, when you're a Catholic contemplative, the goal is d God union. Right. And that yes. was that was in her clearly, you know, she was founded in that and yes. she left and she had children and got married and, you know, she, uh, but always the practice, this, this, um, you know, inquiry, I, you could say an inquiry, she would never call it that, but this was going on all the time, this practice, but it wasn't her doing anything because in her tradition and within the, God is doing it. <laughs> You're in the way. Right. But so we could say God, she doesn't mean the man in the sky. Right. She means infinite existence. Okay. And it's like, this is, happening and it's it's being revealed in nature it's being revealed in in you know so many other ways too for her but she describes things very intensely her experiences or she's describing them very clearly but um when the cell fell away can you hear that scraping noise yeah 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 that's that's my somebody outside shoveling snow <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Nice soundtrack for the conversation. Yeah, yeah. So when when that uh, she just describes this um, the falling away of the self and and the terror, just the you know and just being abandoned wow. by God, you know, just every, losing everything so incredibly vividly. When I read it, I just went into. I mean, it was it just took me right out there. <laughs> <laughs> so um i would recommend her <laughs> but you know then then i feel i feel she she um it is my own just my own feeling so i wanted to be, after i read that i wanted to be a catholic you know <laughs> i wanted to go to mass every day <laughs> wow. i wanted to and i actually did for a while i i um there was in times square i worked in times square in, in a law firm but mm -hmm. there's a a a chapel there called the Actors Chapel. Okay. It's a beautiful Catholic church. It's small, but it. And I started going to mass every day, and I would, I would, you know. And there was this great Irish priest, you know. <laughs> and um, I felt I just had I. And so this is the second Catholic, you know, because first it was when I was a child that in incident. So I had this affinity with it. And then also uh, Bernadette described this falling away, just like Yuji, yeah. but it was within her framework as a Catholic. Right. You know? So I just, I, I just, it's always so interesting because I felt like 
when I met you, I Yuji had this, and then Bernadette had this, and they are complete. They're man and a woman. They each had four kids, too. Catholic, a Hindu. You know, they're just from this totally different environment. Wow. Having this com this complete happen to them, you know, and being communicators, because Yuji didn't write, but he he definitely talked, and she wrote. And she had some, she would have these little, ga you know, um, retreat things that she did. I went to a few of them. Um, but, uh, you know, they were communicators of this. Yeah. So not everyone that it happens to is a communicator. So they, they were. And um, just always, just amazed me, you know, when I think about Eugene Bernadette, you know, having this complete falling away of the self in two different worlds, you know, and... Uh, I always found that really amazing. And actually Adi Da had, you know, this is interesting. Bernard, Adi Da read Bernadette. Oh, really? and, and the community, they had an, a magazine. It was called The Laughing Man. Okay. And he said, we should interview her. Wow. So, so the editors got in touch with her and said, we want to interview you for our magazine. Yeah. They told her, you know, it's Adi Da. You know. And she, and they said, but, but uh, we want your permission to, um, uh, after we interview you, we, we're going to, how, how is it they put it? They always were trying to put people into the framework of the seven stages, you know? So she was, according to uh, Adi Da, Ramana was sixth stage. Mm -hmm. And she's saying, well, okay, you can, you can talk about how I fit into your s seven stages. If you allow me <laughs> to then comment on, you know, your comment, right. and they, they didn't agree to it. She was, she was very ornery. <laughs> she, she wasn't very impressed by him at all. <laughs> hmm. well, in, in retrospect, do you see flaws with Adidas teaching or do you just see it as, I mean, how, how do you view it once you get to the stage with the no self or where there's no stages for, I mean, for like, yeah. How do you look at Adidas' message in retrospect? Well, I I think the it he created a circumstance where there was no way that anybody could go beyond his sixth stage, <laughs> even Ramana. Ramana. <laughs> Nobody could, and and I feel like okay, I had to jump to the seventh stage. He he created a system where he obstructs that mm. very thing, mm. and. Um, it was, uh, I don't know, because I had had such a response to him, you know, right. it's very strong. Right. So, so I think within the traditions, there are people that have these incredible cities that, you know, that powers or cities or, or realizations or ecstasies, right. you know, this ecstasies, they, these are all part of the stages. You know, if you have the human being, you have the, the, the child, the, the adolescent, the, the, the adult, the, you know, you, all these stages. And within this, once you get to the fourth, what he calls the fourth stage, that's where the spiritual life begins. Um, <clears throat> there are people all over the world that, that in the fourth stage, you could, you, you're just having incredible boxy and, and beautiful experiences of the divine, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and all these, these, um, these are people having these experiences and he did. Right. He, he and he he transmitted that you know but it was not it, it was still an experience right and and something if, if your proclivity is to get out of experience then you right. have to see through that at a certain point and it drops yeah i i remember yeah because i had an experience a couple years ago and i remember i was scouring everything Ramana ever said about experiences and I I came across this one quote question and answer he gave to someone or someone was asking him about you know is the experience is samadhi something that involves like great love and light and all this sort of thing which is sent roughly what happened happened to me a, a couple of years ago for a short period of time and, and then he said no he said that's what happens when you leave samadhi or is the language he used he said that's what happens when the mind is claiming everything he's like samadhi is just back to the ordinary i mean he used the word sahaja samadhi which 
a lot of people interpret as a very special state, but really Sahaja just means ordinary. It means natural, you know, so. Yeah, I don't know. I think within the stages, uh, you know, within, like if you're practicing yeah. in uh, say a bhakti, as a bhakti or a, a devotee, you know, very strongly, you know, yeah. that can be a samadhi. You have, you have samadhis, but. Yeah, yeah, right. There, there, and then, and I mean, then, yeah, so. But I guess to me, samadhi always seemed to be like an absorption, you know, through the, like a, a, an absorption into this. Yeah. Uh, yes, you know. yes, but yes, exactly, exactly. But I, I think his point of it was that um, the moment you're describing it or claiming it, then there's this separation there. It's like mm -hmm. me experience you know like i'm the no self essentially you know and that's but, but then can can you can't you you say that, so in a sense samadhi implies an experience of some kind of spiritual uh, you know well, um, dimension or or the, the way the, yes well yes and no like the, the the way that i um so i mean yeah from years of studying the way ramana talked about it which I don't think he came up with any of this. I think he just, um, this was the tradition he was around, surrounded by, so he was answering questions on this topic. You know, there's what they call Savikalpa Samadhi, and mm -hmm. then Nirvikalpa Samadhi, Nirvikalpa. and then yeah. Sahaja Samadhi. And so these are different types of experiences being described, except in Ramana's most, you could say, direct language, he, he would, he actually, in, in this, this one book that he um, basically co-wrote, you could say, or edited, um, called um, The Garland of Guru Sayings, um, or uh, Vachaka, uh, Guru Vachaka Kovai is the title and whatever, Tamil. But it's, um, yeah, he only has, it's an enormous book. It's like 1,200 pages. And he only has like one sentence on samadhi in it, or one paragraph, one book. Mm -hmm. and, and the only thing he says on samadhi is something to the effect of it's, it's just what is, it's just, so like, it, so he would just go to the deepest sense. He didn't really, he would only answer about these temporary states, which people call Savakulpa and Nirvakulpa Samadhi. He would only answer those questions to people that were really invested in that structure of, of thinking, I guess. I mean. Oh yeah, because in Hinduism, they have it defined yeah. so, you know, incredibly, everything is covered, you know, uh, yeah, I'd, they I'd, don't I'd, miss it, anything. Right. So in a sense, Adi Dahl was continuing this tradition of the multiple he was. Yeah. You know, he yeah. Didn't, yeah. Yeah. And this this was also where um, a lot of new age comes from, from the Blavatsky spiritualism school. I don't know if you ever encountered that, but they also have their stages, yeah. you know, and, you know, it's sort of the westernized version of the Hindu levels. Um, yeah, they got they got all that from Hinduism. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, yeah. Which is. Yeah. yeah I mean, and, and I think it's the way I look at that stuff now is like, I look at it like music or art or dance where it's just like a beautiful, you know, like human, like the mind or the brain, whatever you want to call it, like loves creativity, loves complexity and loves poetry. And, and, and you know, when, once all of this is seen as just that, it's beautiful. But when it's really invested in like, oh, how am I going to get to the next level? Like, why am I not there? And my friends are there or this guru is there, it's, it's torturous. It's absolutely like torturous because you're, you're just telling yourself you're not good enough essentially, or you're telling yourself there's, there's something to do that you have, mm -hmm. is this, uh, yeah, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and some people watching this might be feeling that right now. They might be saying like, I understand intellectually what Tony Parsons says, what Tim Cliss says, but I haven't experienced it yet, you know? And, and that so many people feel that way, you know, and um, again, what, what would you say about that? <laughs> this is, you can experience all these spiritual things or not, you could try and you can, but you can't experience this. Right. This is the end of that, the end of experience, the end of you, the end of it. That's it. It's also the beginning of it, but <laughs> it's the end, the beginning, the, it's gone. Yeah. What's that? Gone beyond beyond. Yeah, yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. I'm, I'm not good at remembering sayings right now, but there's, 
there's one that Paul Hederman often quotes that's really beautiful. That's something like, um, you know, gone beyond the, sh gone to the shore, ha gone beyond the shore, having never left, or having found the other side, having never upon having never left. It it's this paradox, you know, it, it's this apparent paradox, you know. And um, I, I want to ask you a different question that came to mind. Um, what's your relationship been like this? I mean, you said your, your ex-husband to CG, he, um, he was, I, I assume you could speak to him about this, but I guess I'm just curious, what has your um, experience been like talking to your, have you ever talked to your children about this or your family or, or close friends? What's that been like? I, I have such a great family, <laughs> my kids. I mean, it's amazing after what I went through as a child that you know, but to CG, to CG's mother taught me what it was to be a mother, <laughs> not my mother, but, and to, and to love, wow. you know, and to, um, and she um, always loved me as her daughter, you know, and when I needed to go do what I needed to do, this spiritual search, she totally understood it and helped. And, and she always loved my children. And, you know, he never made me feel guilty that I was away from them for eight years. I mean, I saw them now and then, but <clears throat> basically, which I felt very guilty about, <laughs> but at the same time, he never, that was not, he never made me feel that. And he never made the children feel, you know, wow. and when I was ready to come back, I was welcome with open arms. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and his mother actually, cause you know, his sisters, they were kind of pissed at me you know, or, or didn't, you know, they don't understand, you know, when a mother does that, that's how could you, you know? Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah. his mother said, no, she's my daughter. Wow. It was like, you know, I was always family with them. And I met her when I was 15 and I never met anyone like her, you know? And I don't know, in Brooklyn, this is in Brooklyn and there's a place, Brooklyn Heights and down by the docks, yeah. That's where they lived in this little funny little area. And um is that near, is that yeah, near Coney Island or somewhere else? What's that? Is that near Coney Island or somewhere? No, no, no. Else? Brooklyn Heights is right on the water, right on the river. Okay. It's right across from Manhattan, you know. Okay. One stop on the subway when you're in Manhattan. Um <clears throat> so uh so, so yeah, so that was part of it. And then always we've just family, you know, we're family. So I knew that at a certain point I was, I, I was no longer um, a wife. I didn't, you know, I, I needed, I wasn't, didn't want to be a wife and be with Tasiji in that way, mm -hmm. but we never, we always had this connection to each other, like a, a very strong connection. I can talk to him anytime he can call, we call each other you know it's it's always there um he has a spiritual teaching he writes books but musically it's the music is what it was for me not right. his you know his teaching wor works I, um i can't say i resonate or don't resonate i don't feel a need for it but the music was so um important for me because it it's you know when you talk about art like music um yeah, yeah. uh painting, poetry, yeah. all of those. To me, the highest is when it's coming from, you know, there's no one there doing it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. and so this is to CG's music and um, he never had a lesson in his life. He never, no one ever taught him how to play music. Yeah. He drummed first, he was a drummer first. Oh. And um, he played with Mongo Santa Maria when he was a child. You know, they found him like he was a prodigy and, you know, brought him to play. I don't know if you know who that is, but that's a very high level, you know, Latin musician, you know. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, so when we met, we had this musical um, connection because I was, my, I was raised around, first of all, my father, my family, my, they loved jazz. My mother, Billie Holiday is my godmother. So, um, you know, I had this connection to, um, Jazz. literally or yeah yeah <laughs> well she when when i when my mother was pregnant with me she used to go to 52nd street and and um there were all these jazz 
venues there and she was singing all the time in this one place and my mother would go all the time to hear her play because my mother was living right there in that area hell's kitchen hell's kitchen area and um so i was born in hell's kitchen so (laughs) so um billy what after she sang was singing one night and she went up to my mother and put her hands on my on my mother's belly and said when the baby is born i'll be her godmother oh wow so as far as i'm concerned she's my godmother (laughs) That's it. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, yeah, so we had this connection. And so when we got together, that was, you know, I recognized I was young, 15 when I met him. He was very hot, too. He looked like Bernardo in West Side Story, you know, (laughs) but but I I just I just felt his genius, you know. And um, so all I could say to him was, you're a musician, you know, that's and then because he he had that. It was, he was always playing and music was, and, and also singing with, um, th- there was an acapella group that he sang with. So I knew that, you know, he was a musician. And, and so when I connected with him uh, through the music, that's, that was a great teacher to me. Yeah. Because he plays from, from now. He plays from, from, from nowhere, from spirit. And, and what Paul Schaefer has played with him a lot. He met him in Toronto. He became oh, wow. part of his band. And Paul says, uh, Tosiji takes you out there and he leaves you there. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You sent me one of his songs that was really beautiful. Um, something about the universe or the heart. Of the- yeah, the heart, the, yeah, the heart of the, uh, that was a, a concert he gave. So it was like a, a, a yeah, that was a, a really video cool. of a concert. Yeah, the heart is the universe. I think the heart is the universe. Yeah. Heart is the, yeah, that was really beautiful. And, uh, and there's also, I think, a documentary on him you mentioned. Or you sent me. Is that on right? on to CG, there are, there are different things. Yeah. 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 Some video. There's a lot of music. It's recorded, and he also um, talks, gives these funny little talks. Yeah. He's he's a sham. He's very shamanistic in his in his way of being with people, and then the musicians come to him because they they for instance if they're classically trained or even jazz musician, um, they want to be able to play with that freedom. They want to let that out. They want to let go and let that music start yeah. coming, and so they go to him for that. You know. Yeah. So. Um... So yeah, we didn't talk much about Tony Parsons or these modern, not so-called non-dual teachers, you know, which this YouTube channel nothing um, features a lot of. Um, I was wondering if you had any, if you wanted to say anything about that part, discovering Tony, you know. And- well, yeah, because of you, you know, Yuji died, and YouTube, YouTube is there, you know. Yeah. Started looking around on YouTube, not searching, but you know, just. Checking yeah. and then, then I saw um, something non-duality something and then uh, found Tony. Um, and when I heard him talking, I was like, you know, just that little thing comes alive. Yes, yes, you know, that's it, that's it. Yeah. And it's it's. Um, I actually, I think I I I got in touch with him. I forget how I did it. Whether I I didn't call him. I sent him an email, I think, and I, I wanted to send him a, um, the book that I did, the, yeah. uh, you know, Yuji's book, because yeah. I, I asked him, because I thought well, these people are talking, they're saying the same thing as Yuji, a lot of, but different, but but yeah, I could feel, and I thought, well, he must have heard about Yuji, you know? So I said, have you heard of Yuji? And I sent him a book and then he called me <laughs> and he told me, he said, um, I like Yuji because he's a bad boy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but um, I find <clears throat> what's happening, and actually, Tim, I, I listened to something Tim said the other day, and and it it hit home to me because I felt that, but he expressed it really well. Um, that it, 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 you could say non-duality, and somebody, it, it's kind of like um, there's like a little the church of non-duality. I call it, yeah. you know, it becomes it becomes like a, a thing. Right. And, and um, so it doesn't. um, No thing becomes a thing. Yeah. It's like you're talking about non-duality, but you're making it into something that is supposed to, you know, 
so it's I think that maybe people just need to do that maybe that's you know they discover it and then it's all wow you know it kind of releases a lot of things for them and and um yeah, yeah like so I don't um I don't know it seems to be a very imp big important thing going on right now and, and, and for you personally what's what's big and important for you right now what what, what if you nothing. Had <laughs> nothing. nothing is bigger important but i i do enjoy um sometimes just like you when you have your meetings on sunday i go to those yeah yeah and um <clears throat> there's you know it's, it's social it's just we're social beings and we're right. we're sharing just you know you're looking in your eyes you're talking i'm hearing you yeah. it's just something that's happening yeah yeah, I spend a lot of time alone. I have children and great grandchildren and grandchildren, so I I'm you know always see my kids and family. You know that that's part of it. But I'm not a very um, social person. I I spend a lot of time alone, and um, if if the kids need me for something, they call me. You know, I need this. I need that. Fine, that's good. You know, but I'm not like making dinner every Sunday for everybody. You know, that's not the kind of mom I am. But I do. Um, I feel like uh, you know, so maybe there's a need to just talk to people about this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I relate to that. Yeah. yeah. And, and for me personally, I mean, the reason why I started my meeting and people could just find me on Facebook if they want more information and message me. But it's what what I wanted out of that meeting is um, to have a space where people could share their own expression, their own experience of this or of being a seeker or of what, wherever they're at and um, just have the freedom to do that without, in an environment that wasn't quite, you know, where they were being directed by someone on a stage, which I don't think there's anything wrong with that necessarily, but I, for, but yeah, there's a social aspect, right? It, and for me, it's also like as a musician and artist, like I love, I just love hearing different voices, you know, like I love hearing like groups of musicians perform and I love seeing different types of artists, you know, from Pollock to Van Gogh to Rothko. I love the, the, the diversity. And so I, I love hearing how differently people can speak about this, you know, like- Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. And the stories are, are fun too, you know, I yeah. mean, yeah. You know, and when you talk, when you go to a meeting uh, with Jim, or I like, I mean, they were all such interesting how they each have a way of communicating. It's very different. And I find that very interesting. And who the hell knows if anyone's, you know, like lost their, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. You don't know anything, yeah. but, but I love the communication and, and the, but when they, they talk and then somebody we're, they're not, you're not there to tell your story. You know, I'm not there to tell you about, my whole life story and you, but you always want people to share something about that's personal to them you know which i think is it's interesting too you know it's just um it's part of life you know you just yeah personal to, or impersonal just whatever people want to share you exactly know? but yeah. we we did listen a lot we did that a lot the other, last sunday we yeah, yeah, last yeah, Sunday. More I asked, so than usual. Yeah. Well, last Sunday, I asked Harvey and Chuck Hillig, but both of which I'm probably going to interview soon. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and I just asked, yeah, it, it just came up that way spontaneously, I think, because mm -hmm. this, that, that kid, Jens, um, he, yeah, he, he brought up something about the education system, and Harvey happened to be a philosophy professor. So I thought it was a good segue to just hear his story and his perspective. So we could get his perspective on the education system and how it, how little or mu much it allows people to discover their own way of putting things. Because a lot of the education system is yeah, they they care. <laughs> yeah. just their 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 job is to get you to fit into the status quo. Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah. if you have a creative or you know you don't function in that way, then that mm. doesn't work too well. But um, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I and I get that sense as well from spiritual teachers or non-dual teachers, where yeah. you know if you're in their meeting and you're not speaking their language, you get corrected, you get hit with the zen. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and you know, yeah, I've had that happen. 
and that's yeah. what it is. But yeah, I, I, I feel like, um, yeah, w- one thing I just like to bring up, um, you, you, because you mentioned this and I find this interesting, you said that UG wanted people to be successful in their own private life and particularly women for some reason he was supportive of in a way. Um, was really, yeah, he was supportive of women and, and he always, he was very, I guess he always brought up money, you know, you yeah. need to make money, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. like very practical. Yeah. That, um, yeah. And he didn't, uh, yeah, he wasn't trying to get people to um, meditate and do do practices and all that type of thing. But to, and it wasn't, yeah. and it wasn't that he wanted people to make money to give it to him. Either. It was just no, yeah. no, yeah. 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 And um, when uh, there was, uh, he had these money maxims, one hundred and eight money maxims. <laughs> And, and it came, it was like a, um, things he would say that were just, some of them were, you know, like make money by any means necessary, you know, <laughs> like, or, you know, but, but there were also things that were really like, um, they were very, ra- uh, d- you know, radical in a way, but he would just say these things about money. And so right. there were 108 of them and, you know, 108, that's like that sacred number, right? So a friend in Germany made these cards out of them, the the money maxim cards. I, I used to have them. I don't know what I did with them, but um, so there were 108. And so one day he he had the cards and he opened them and y- Yuji said to me, pick a card. So I picked a card and it said, take the dough and hit the road. <laughs> 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 and so he looked at me, you know, and then I knew right away, I quit my job. I sold my apartments. Oh. I took early retirement. And that's when I started traveling with him. Wow. Yeah. It was like, you know, just something in there. So, and I don't have money. I'm very poor, actually, you know, relatively poor. Mm-hmm. I don't, but everything I need, I always get what I need to, to survive. You know, just like what I, my needs and my wants are the same, you know, just, just what, uh, or my wants and my needs are the same. Mm-hmm. I don't need very much, but um, I never have to worry about money. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and gosh, and I'm sure you have so many great stories. And when you hit the road with UG, I mean, yeah. That, yeah. You know, so, <laughs> you know, someone might see this interview and want to, someone who want to interview you about more of those stories, but I. Well, you know, I would also re- recommend if anybody's interested in UG or what it's like to travel with him is Julie has a, um, Julie Thayer, she wrote a book. Uh, well, she it isn't a, a book. She just wrote Travels with Yuji. Okay. And it's online. Everything is free. You can get all of Yuji's books online free. You know, it, um, and you can also buy my book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's another thing. I never got royalties when Non-Duality Press had it. And I never got royalties because there's no copyright. So I would, and, and it's been translated in, all over the world. But then Non-Duality Press um, sold, sold, was sold to New Harbinger. Okay. Y- you know Catherine Noyce or, anyway, no. doesn't matter. So, so uh, they, they, um, they sold, Non-Duality Press was sold to New Harbinger. So they became the publishers, right? Yeah. And um, all of a sudden they started sending me royalties. Even though it says it, and, and I told, and then the one woman called me and said, we, somebody in another country, I don't know, Holland or something, wants to publish the book. Um, we want to know if we can have rights to, pu-. I said, there's no copyright. And they, they, it's like they, but they send me royalties. It's not very much, but <laughs> I always love it when I get a check, you know? Yeah. 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 But it's like, um, it's been translated into Spanish and, you know, Hindi and uh, um, Italian, um, Dutch, you know, yeah. it's like the Dutch have a very strong connection to Yuji. They do, because he, he um, like, there's a magazine, yeah, this Dutch magazine that I, they did, that, you know, I had like a little thing I wrote in there and I couldn't read it because it was in Dutch, but a friend of mine translated it, so. <laughs> Yeah, and and UG is also some people will resonate with him, but maybe he's not for everyone at the same. No, time. no, you don't have to resonate. <laughs> That's the beauty of this. It's you know, um, 
Yeah, I, I saw nothing. This YouTube, our YouTube channel, they just uploaded an interview with John Butler, who has a very different flavor that I like. It's like a sort of yeah, the non a non dual Christianity type thing. You know, maybe maybe similar to Bernadette, maybe different from her even. I don't know, but um, just so many. Well, Bernadette things. would never say non dual. To her, it's total duality. God, you know, no. and the, 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 this dimension, the, you know, it's yeah, a, yeah, yeah. Different, there are different dimensions of, she, she doesn't talk about it as non-duality. Well, that's and when the self falls away, then there's nothing. Right, It's right. not that now it's non-dual. And, 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 that <laughs> and that's probably, that might be quite similar to how John Butler puts it as well. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's... Yeah, it's just, it's beautiful how there's so many different flavors and expressions that people may or may not be resonant with, with this sort of thing. And, and yeah, do, do you have any other, um, let's say, final things you'd like to share um, about just in general to people listening? Well, I was thinking the other day you said that you were into Gurdjieff at one time. Yeah, I, I started my journey with Gurdjieff. With Gurdjieff, or, you yeah. know, and, and he I, wrote. I, I he have, wrote I have the same birthday as Gurdjieff too. Funny. Right, and he wrote that um, meetings with remarkable men. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he was really into story. Yeah, he you was. Know, and that, yeah, and yeah. dance and music, and you know, very much into that whole, <clears throat> you know, creative atmosphere. But yeah. the one thing I felt that he never got was that he was into effort. It's a, a lot about self-effort oh. to get to from one thing to another. Yeah, he was very, he was very practice oriented. Very. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That, that's true. You know, it's interesting. There, there's this amazing book that I found um, a few years ago that blew me away about some some woman who was a part of his. I think she was like his personal assistant, kind of secretary at his for a while, and and then she. In her, she, she started her journey in her 40s. I would recommend this book to anyone who finds this, this part this interesting um, because, she meant, because she spent many years with Gurdjieff and then also many years with um, Ramana Maharshi and Ananda Mahima. Ma. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and it's very interesting to hear her journey. Um, the book is called A Woman's Work. Mm -hmm. A Woman's Work. And you could get it on... Um, yeah, Amazon for anyone who's interested. It's a really interesting story where by the end of her life, she she sort of does, I'd say a bit of mental gymnastics to see Gurdjieff's work in the light of Ramana's teaching as all kind of connected, but she's, but she's always questioning it. She's always just wondering, like, what was Gurdjieff talking about? Because Gurdjieff, <laughs> I mean, Gur Gurdjieff kind of, yeah, I, I, I don't, he was doing something else that was very beautiful and interesting and inspires many people to this day. But, um, you know, I think Gurdjieff himself said b before he died, that he never even got to finish saying what he wanted to say. And he said, nobody ever got what he was trying to say, but yeah, <laughs> but, but, but you bring up Gurdjieff. Um, yeah. Because, and also, cause it's like what we're talking about um, when I was listening to the stories on Sunday, it's yeah. like meetings with remarkable men. That's kind of what we're talking about, or women. But you know, yeah. just just yeah. our journey. You know, like um, all the things we've been through, yeah. and it seems like this is something going on with human beings right now because we're exhausting, and we're coming <laughs> across this this anarchy in the un the universe. You know, we're coming across this, so the brain is starting to to um i think adjust right that you know so gurdjieff, gurdjieff came along at a certain point and you know what what this talking about the experiences right and what happened yeah, yeah. and you know when it happened and how it happened and why it happened yeah. but it's like it, you know so it reminded me of that when you, when you were talking about gurdjieff and and that there is that why we're doing you know why are we not that there's a reason but yeah we're talking we're expressing that's all it's just um a natural it's something that's happening it's very natural i think for the human talking and expressing and and, and maybe let's end this with um your commentary on this this famous ug quote about 
barking, being like a barking dog. Well, he didn't say we were being like a barking dog, but he said when he's talking, it's like a dog barking. Yeah. That's all. It, it's not, you know, and, and all, you know, when we're talking, yeah. two dogs barking. <laughs> you know? that but it didn't, in, in that sense, it doesn't mean anything. And he doesn't know what he's, you know, what he's saying or what's going to come out. And he's not trying to get a point across. He's not trying to teach you anything. He didn't like it when he felt like suddenly if he was talking, he would often say in, in interviews, you can hear him sometimes say this, I don't want to give a talk because he didn't like when he started to sound like he was giving a talk. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, so, so that is, it's like just noise, <laughs> music, poetry, just, yeah. <laughs> that's it. Well, beautiful. Well, that's a beautiful note to end on. Thank you so much for having this conversation with me, Ellen. It's always nice to talk to you, Art. So awesome. <laughs> thank you. All right. All right.